Welcome back. I'm Brandon, the HBAR Bull, once again joined by Zepsi. We both do some contract work for the HBAR Foundation, but we don't do these weekly updates in any official capacity. We're just coming to you personally to give you the latest in the Hedera ecosystem. Welcome back, Zep. How's it going, Brandon? It's going really good. I have a lot of exciting stuff that we want to cover this week. But as always, none of this is financial advice. Use it for entertainment or educational purposes only. The first thing I want to touch on here is I I caught the All In Summit, the All In podcast. They were talking to Brian Armstrong. Of course, Brian is one of the great leaders in the space. He is the CEO of Coinbase. And he had some really interesting insights. You should definitely go check out the entire thing. But there was one segment where David Sachs was just asking about the use cases. And I thought it was interesting. So let's watch that clip and then we'll come back and talk about it. So I want to ask you about uh, use cases, Brian. So I think, you know, we've had Bitcoin now for over a decade. I think it's been volatile, but I think proven very robust. No one's been able to double spend a Bitcoin. I think like for store of value, I think that use case is pretty much proven. Then we had the rise of Ethereum and this idea of a world computer. And there was a lot of talk for a while, especially like during the like very frothy sort of bubbly period that there'd be all these use cases, you know, that were, would be built on the world computer. People might even be running social networks on them, stuff like that. Um, I think there's sort of been a correction from that. I mean, I think people now sort of realize there's certain, there's a lot of applications where it just makes sense to use a centralized database. Blockchains wouldn't be efficient enough for that. I'm kind of wondering at what point, at, at this point, where do we stand in terms of use cases being proven out beyond the original Bitcoin store of value? Like, You know, what are the other big applications that have either been validated or that we should expect to be built on top of all this this infrastructure? Now, Zep, Brian goes on to talk about stablecoins, DeFi, NFT as like the things that are going on now and the things that have gone on in the past. He also talks about uh, decentralized identification, which is, of course, someplace where Hedera is leading. But I'm just kind of shocked that some of these, not necessarily Brian, of course, Brian knows what's going on, but that these some of the brightest minds in tech, some of the most well-informed minds in tech, like David Sachs, don't know everything that's that's going on in this space. They talk about it a fair amount, but you know these guys, again, who are some of the brightest minds and most well-informed in minds, they don't know what your average H barbarian knows about Hyundai and at my O and what we're going to talk about today with ServiceNow and WorldPay. What are your thoughts around you know the general knowledge of what's going on in the Hedera ecosystem? So I think there's an inclination within some of these people to to really only sort of pay attention to what's going on within the Ethereum ecosystem. As he said, you know, the Ethereum was meant to be this sort of world computer and a lot of innovation, a lot of the most of the development activity and so on and so forth has, has been around that vision. But there's certain services that Ethereum can't provide, you know, things like the Hedera consensus service, which are the perfect market fit for completely different applications that Ethereum doesn't even really have the ability to fathom. And so I think there's a a lot of these people look at everything from within the scope or the confines of the bottlenecks of Ethereum and haven't really looked too far beyond that in this, this sort of early stage of the market. And so I would like to hope as Ethereum becomes more adopted, as I'm sure it will, but as these more enterprise use cases come online, the ones that use, you know, the Hedera consensus service, the Hedera network services like the Guardian and so on and so forth, as those almost to become too big to ignore, both from the press side, but also from investors and so on, I'd like to think that a whole new avenue of sort of utility, at least in the minds of these people, will be opened, and then they'll be looking towards some of the other chains like Hedera. Because, yeah, I, I think they're just restricted by the confines of the early promise of Ethereum, and that that hasn't really adjusted to the new market yet. Well, I, I think the age barbarians, sometimes they're, they're ripping their hair out just because they see all the innovation that's taking place within our space, uh, but the, the rest of the world doesn't see it. But that's just fine. We're still building. We're coming up with these great applications. I mean, even Coinbase highlighted what Acor is doing and what Health Ready is doing with Jim Nasser. So it's not that that information isn't out there. It just needs to become more pervasive. It just needs to get out there a little bit more. And that's what we're trying to do here. If you're not bullish by the end of this show, uh, I'll be absolutely shocked. So the first thing we're going to touch on is WorldPay and and their use case that we covered pretty extensively last week, but we wanted to get the inside track. So I got a hold of Cypressad. He is a strategic advisor with FIS WorldPay, and he's also on a couple of the committees within the Hedera ecosystem or on the Hedera Governing Council. So let's listen to what he has to say. 
Sai, thank you so much for swinging by today, and welcome. Thank you. So I'm going to jump right into it. Can you explain the WorldPay proof of concept that was announced last week, including what participants were involved with this project? Yeah, sure. So let me give you some background. If you look at the traditional settlement rails, wherein you have your consumer bank and Visa and MasterCards and acquirers like and payment processors like WorldPay, and then you have merchant banks. So these four pillars, they used to have the traditional payment rails using fiat. And if you look at the visa and the world pay, uh, when they are actually flowing and having this payment settlements, they also have to consider the forex. They have to convert the fiat from one currency to another currency. And in this entire rail, usually it takes one to four days and also it has the blackout days, the holidays and the weekends. And that's why it adds a lot of delays in that. To kind of improve on, on that settlement, process to ease that process to improve the, the speed on that we have launched our usdc settlement uh, last year which was to improve the overall settlement speed so while we did that the usdc settlement with the help of you know with the partnership from circle and the far blocks what we achieved is the higher settlement speed so we can remove those dependencies from from the banks like right? and those blackout days wherein you have higher settlement speed. Now in this one, when we achieved the USDC settlement, what we also thought is, is there a way we can improve the trust and the transparency to the merchants? So in this case, imagine a merchant who wants to have a dashboard where they would like to know what's the proof of this particular settlement that I am receiving as a part of the uh, stable coins, right? And for these stable coins, when they are receiving it, this one dashboard that will give them the overall auditability, traceability, right, uh, on, on top of that. So what we have achieved here in this POC is that proof of reserves, or I would call it proof of deposits, wherein merchant will have one single place where they will be able to see the overall settlement transparency and the trust. Okay, I understand. So you mentioned Visa and MasterCard, and we noticed that in the flowchart that you had. Now, that's going to catch a lot of attention when it comes to the Hedera community. How did they fit into this picture overall? Yeah, that's a great question. So Visa has recently uh, announced their stablecoin settlement to us using the USDC. And in this one, when we are receiving the stablecoins, from the visa to the world pay and imagine now from world pay to the merchants bank so there are two legs that are involved in here so that's where there is very exciting news that we are not only from the world pays to the merchants bank but now also we are receiving the stable coins from the entities like visa to us why exactly was hedera chosen for this proof of concept that's a great question so as you know, World Pay from FIS, we are on the governing council for Hedera. So it was obvious choice for us to build on Hedera. But it's not the only reason. I would say Hedera, because it's an enterprise level DLT, it gives you the finality within two to five seconds. It has the fair ordering. It also has the higher TPS, right? So, and the most important thing for the enterprise level organization for us, there is the predictive fees that is offered by Hedera in this case. So these are all the reasons for us to choose Hedera for our POC here. If you look at this entire flow, when we are having this stablecoin settlement to the merchants, when the USDC stablecoin settlements are happening and where we are leveraging this oracle solution we are using the hashboard axiom pro for the oracle enterprise level oracle regret solution uh, what it does is it takes these different feeds uh, the data feeds for the deposits for usdc minting and also the usdc settlements and it is routing these feeds to the hedaraj hcs and hcs is becoming a central dlt storage for those attestations and these attestations are then available on Arkea, which is the, the mirror node. And then we are using the Arkea's dashboards for our merchants to have that you know, auditability, traceability, 
and the transparency. So merchants will be able to see the attestations of this proof of reserves on a single dashboard. Is this just a, a fun proof of concept, a side project for award pay, or should we expect this to actually hit the market? Yes, definitely. This is not only the POC. When we actually build this, we wanted to have this more as a settlement service for any such particular uh, stable coin. So in the future, right now, this is currently been implemented with the USDC, but uh, from the scalability and robustness perspective, this particular service or this entire POC can be extended to the any particular stable coin in the future. And uh, as we are seeing the traction from the CBDCs in the future, this can also fit such integrations in the future that can leverage this particular service. Understood. So there's one more thing that I'm curious about. You know, Visa mentioned that they're using a duff- couple different platforms for their USDC. Do you think Hedera's version of USDC will take a, a more prominent role in the future? There is a possibility that the HUSDC can also be part of this entire ecosystem. And as you know, that circles uh, underlying blockchains, uh, what's been covered. So there is header also included in that. So as the demand increases in the HUSDC, we will see much more traction for the HUSDC on the header of for the such stable coins, definitely. Sai, this is so exciting. Thank you so much for swinging by, taking the time to explain this exciting project and good luck. Thank you. So, Zeb, of course, the World Pay Proof of Reserves settlement system was announced at Token 2049, but Hedera is making a splash at several different large conferences throughout the world, one of them being TechCrunch. And the interesting thing about TechCrunch is it's one of the largest tech conferences in the world, but it's not just focused on Web3, where a lot of the conferences we're involved in are. Another thing that Hedera is doing that I'm really impressed with is initially they focused on, of course, the tech, the governance, things like that. And, and and then we moved into a phase where we were focusing on the potential use cases and, and maybe even some of the use cases that we're building. But now we're getting to a point where we're focusing on the use cases that are already built. We can actually get people's hands on these applications at the actual event. I don't know if you saw this, but Ed Marquez, he's one of the developer advocates at Swirls Labs. He put out a twidgetized version of himself in a tweet. It looked absolutely fantastic. But my partner, Jesse Damro at Twidgetal is out there. He's working the booth for Head Dara at TechCrunch, and he had a quote for us. He said, TechCrunch was a great experience. Twigital is poised to introduce the concept of tokenized digital twins to the world. It has been an opportunity for me to provide live demos of the application and discuss the process and methodology. Inevitably, most of these conversations evolve into use case specific scenarios. I love that most people get it and immediately see the product market fit. So well done to Jesse. He's out there representing not only Twigital, but Hedera at the booth. We've seen all kinds of stuff coming out on Twitter. We appreciate that. But there's another conference that we got some feedback on, and that was permissionless. Zep, can you tell us about that? So we had um, both worlds and the foundation down on the ground at permissionless and of course permissionless at the heart of permissionless is, is DeFi and, and you know discussion around that and those kind of more early stage use cases that are still massive but well you know were some of the big ones that first came out but as i heard this year beyond DeFi, the main sort of talking points were both real world asset tokenization and stable coins um as perhaps the two sort of killer uh, use cases or the killer dApps that will take us sort of mainstream into the world of on-chain finance beyond the current DeFi landscape that we have. And I think what's exciting about that is that for the first time, Hedera is at the forefront of that narrative, shoulder to shoulder with other, the other big players. We didn't have the smart contract service to the scale it is today when the DeFi summer was going on. We didn't have NFTs during the initial NFT boom. It's sort of been catch up. And that's not to say that our ecosystems that we've had, like DeFi and NFTs, haven't had their own success in their own rights, but they couldn't really capture that massive liquidity pool that the early adopters did. Again, what makes us exciting then is that, you know, we've got the likes of DLA Piper, regulation first into real world asset tokenization, got Aberdeen, the biggest wealth manager, active wealth manager in the UK tokenizing their funds on Hedera. We've got Red Swan tokenizing their real estate portfolio. And there's no, more players coming in, more players in the works. So not only do we have the early stages of very robust, but also very well-respected, well-regarded real-world asset 
ecosystem. We also have stablecoins. You know, we've just announced the launch of the stablecoin studio, which is essentially the perfect fit for institutions who want to come in and issue, manage and mint their own stablecoins within Hedera. So not only do they have a platform which makes it take a matter of you know, minutes to hours to mint and manage a stablecoin rather than weeks to months, but they also have the inherent benefits of Hedera, which is also, of course, in the form of the network, the governing council, the stability of that model for financial institutions, but also the hybrid model of the stablecoin itself. So the stablecoin studio uses both the Hedera token service, so it's, you know, of course, 10,000 transactions a second currently, that can be elevated to meet the demand, but it's also a hybrid model with the Hedera smart contract service, which gives it extra programmability, which in the case of a shifting regulatory landscape is particularly important for these issues. If you're an issuer in Singapore, you've got a completely different landscape, regulatory landscape to someone in the US or wherever it might be. So you have to stay up to date with the issuer in your region. You have to have the ability to update that sort of in real time and the ability to make sure everything that is done is done regulation first, otherwise you're going to bet bits in the future. So I think as we have massive institutions like PayPal making their move, as we have massive institutions on our own council like Shinhan, Standard Bank, other ones like Cathy Bank, Jewel Bank, all of these businesses, all of these banks, all of these institutions going all in on stablecoins when that regulation comes in, and if we can provide them with the best infrastructure to facilitate that, I think we're in a perfect position. And I, and I haven't seen any other network have this kind of capability, both from a scalability, programmability, and ease of use sense, and also, of course, the network of council. So I think we're in a very strong position to capture both those narratives. And I hope that we can step up the marketing to match that. And it looks like Twelds are definitely doing that. And it looks like the business development teams at the Hashgraph Association and the foundation are going to be alongside them bolstering that. So yeah, exciting times for those two narratives, for sure. Well, the stablecoin conversation dovetails into the next thing we're going to get into, and that's Shark Bites. Rob covers uh, Token 2049, several of the community questions, so let's listen to that. <laughs> Welcome back, Rob. How's your trip back home? Hey, Brandon. Yeah, it's great to be home always, although I'm about to start traveling again. So um, uh, enjoying the, uh, the time on the lily pad before I, I head off. <laughs> There you go. Well, I hope you enjoy it. So uh, the first thing we're going to get into is last week, it was a bit loud. Is there anything you'd like to recap about the Stablecoin Studio that we discussed? Yes, apologies for the uh, the Bon Jovi in the background. There was nothing I could do about that. Um, Token 2049 was, a, was an excellent event. There's For those who have been to kind of crypto events or Web3 events in other places in the world, it's unlike anything that you may have experienced there. The Asia Pacific region is a is really really strong on Web three, but it has this fun, cartoony, gamey kind of overlay as well. So I always love um, doing the the Asia Pacific conferences because because the the engagement is so different, and uh, the same was the case with Token twenty forty nine. We had all the same kind of um, um, things, you know, some great panels. Mance was there doing a, an, an amazing job as usual on panels and he gave his keynote, which was all around the Stablecoin Studio launch. And then of course we had our governing council member WorldPay announcing the Proof of Reserve project, which is one of our Hashgraph Enterprise program projects. And the booth was awesome. I mean, the booth was beautiful and probably had more footfall, more traffic than, than I've ever seen at a Hedera booth. The difference from last year to this year was that last year in the Asia Pacific region, I think Hedera had a little bit of a branding uh, problem. You know, there was very little brand recognition except in the pockets around the, the projects we were doing. Um, so we had the opportunity to talk about Hedera, you know, answer the what is Hedera question. This year, however, Everyone knew Hedera, and it wasn't just the fact that all of the conference staff, the show staff, had Hedera branded T-shirts, and there were banners everywhere. And obviously, Mance was was there. People actually knew Hedera; they knew H Bar, and um, so the questions were, you know, what about this project? Or I've heard about this. Can you tell me more about it? So um, 
Yeah, huge, uh, huge leap forward, I think, in just 12 months, which recognizes all the work that all the, the organizations are doing across the ecosystem and, uh, and how much, as, as you and I both know well, how many more use cases, how many projects are actually um, making their announcements uh, these days. Yeah, I noticed the same thing at Consensus. People knew what Hedera was, and they had more pointed questions mm. this year than in past years. But we'll get into the community questions now. The first one comes from Eric, and he asked, in a recent podcast, Dr. Lehman Baird confirmed that cross-border payments are also an area in which Hedera wants to be active. To what extent will Hedera be able to compete with, for example, Ripple, which has developed their on-demand liquidity solution specifically for this purpose? Yeah, and that's a great question. The obvious answer is that we have every right to play. We tokenize at the, at the native level. Uh, we have a public distributed ledger which settles transfers in a matter of seconds. And as we know, this is a uh, settlement with legal finality. This is you know absolute settlement, which is which we can't get on any other network, except for the private uh, networks, which you know of which Ripple is one. And the financial services that we work with, the industry, the banks, the payments um, infrastructure, are all part of our ecosystem as well. WorldPay is one of the world's biggest merchant acquiring payments networks. And they've launched their proof of reserve product now, specifically for the settlement uh, with merchants of stablecoins. So, I mean, if that's not a signal, then nothing is. We also, uh, ran the, or we were party to the Australian CBDC pilot recently. So the not centralized team de delivered their trade flows application with stable coins collateralized by a CBDC, which is a very good use case. And cross border remittances um, between banks were the subject of the Shinhan pilot, again, that we announced recently. And they used the Stablecoin Studio technology which is now open source and for everyone to use. So for all these reasons, Hedera has every right to play. In fact, more right to play than most because of its enterprise um, focused nature, its bank grade stablecoin technology that we've now launched and the governing council of whom, you know, four banks, payments providers, etc. Plus in my pipeline and the enterprise uh, pipeline, I'm seeing a lot of, um, payments and financial institution use of the technology. Now, Rob, do you think that people are underestimating the, the size of these enterprises, maybe because they don't know who they are or, you know, the significance of like the proof of concept from Shinhan and from Standard Bank before that mm -hmm. certainly got a lot of attention from the drop fed now news. But do you think they're underestimating some of these other proof of concepts that we're seeing? Well, proofs of concept are a natural first step. Remember, we're still early in the Web3 space. And even though you've got the likes of PayPal now kind of issuing stable coins, um, we've got USDC on Hedera, um, although very low liquidity. Some of the other chains have very high liquidity and uh, so called have a cross chain protocol now. So th there, this is all about utility for me. This is all about how do we make it easier for people to use stable coins on their preferred network or within the applications they prefer that are built on their preferred network, whether or not they know what the network is. So for Hedera, if we have more and more uh, utility, more and more applications using stable coins, whether it be a USDC or one of, one that is issued in, that is pegged to a local currency or some, some entirely different asset type, these, this is programmable money, which can be incorporated into applications, which then drive a, a lot of adoption. So even though we're going through the proof of concept and pilot phase, and I would say we're probably at the tail end of proof of concept, I think we're getting more into that kind of pre-production pilot and, and testing the waters phase, that will come together very quickly. And so as the adoption um, curve gets hit, and it starts to escalate, we'll see more and more and more. And the nature of these things is that you can underestimate them because everything's going on in the background and you know, um, 
you and me and Joe on the street don't really know what's happening behind closed doors. But uh, but trust me, every single organization on financial in, in organization on the planet is now considering its Web3 strategy if, if it isn't actively involved right now. Well, I mean, if CypressSide, which we just heard from, is any indication, they're certainly planning on bringing these proof of concepts to, to market. Mm. All right, so the next one is from Jason Hills. He said, we see news almost daily about institutional partnerships with organizations like Stablecoin Studio and so many others. It's head spinning. These ventures must take dozens of payroll professionals to execute successfully. How are they compensated? Well, these are commercial decisions for the organizations that are um, are investing in their future. So if the question is, how do the uh, the ventures or the enterprises um, reimburse the, the staff that they're deploying, that's entirely commercial decision for those who are uh, progressive or investing in the, the future of their organizations. If the question is, how does the ecosystem support those developments? Then you know we are seeded from the uh, the Hedera Treasury, each you know Swirls and Foundation Association, and each is um, commercializing their operations in you know in ways that are appropriate to those organisations. So you know I can't I can't say more than that, but we have to be sustainable over the long term. We cannot uh, rely upon a treasury which you know is finite. And in order to continue to grow and continue to grow a hundred year network, at some point fairly soon, um, all of these organizations have got to uh, drive forward themselves. And that means you know, co-investment, it means creating funds that can be um, invested into, into the ventures that we're building or supporting the building of. It means partnering with um, established uh, parties that we can bring skills into the into their go-to-market and share that, um, that that delivery with them. So there's many ways of doing it, and there's many ways that uh, one can come to commercial terms with um, counterparties uh, to grow the, the whole of the Hedera ecosystem. That's, that makes a lot of sense. All right, so the last one here is from Kirk. He asks, why would one need to make a stablecoin or want to make a stablecoin as an individual company or an enterprise? Please explain. Which is an excellent question. Let, let's let's set that apart from um, banks and payment systems, right? So stable coins, as defined, would be a token which is uh, pegged to to fiat, so programmable money. And one can probably understand how uh, a bank, for example, would use a stable coin. It's fairly limited in terms of. Um, its utility until you get into some kind of arrangement with other banks to cross redeem the, those those tokens, and you know there are frameworks, there are um, schemes which can be put in place to to set the rules that allow for organisations that um, can can cross um, cross redeem or share you know the um, the stablecoin that they're all um, using. The utility of the stablecoin is um, is therefore about programmable money. It's about um, utility in things like um, DeFi, an institutional DeFi, so you know issued and, and operated by regulated institutions. Um, things like interbank settlement, cross border remittance. We talked about B two B wholesale settlement, um, payments and micro payments. So all of these things kind of use stablecoins because they can program or they can interact via smart contracts or within their platforms in a way that can't be done with traditional money or cash or other forms of digital money in in the pre-Web3 space, which were tended to be on, based on centralized systems. Now, what could stable coins be used for for non financial services. That's that's super interesting. So where a stable coin is backed by some other kind of asset and it can be issued in a way where you can have super scale as we can with, with Hedera. You can then start tokenizing interesting things backed by other stuff. So imagine rewards points backed by fractions of carbon credit potentially. Imagine uh, commodities uh, being used like money within the context of a um, um, 
you know, that particular ecosystem's um, platform or services. An interesting one was from Diamond Standard. Diamond, Company, I was about to say Diamond to Standard, little, yeah. Yeah, they, they want to do kind of a stablecoin idea based off of diamonds and then use them in casinos. So people, if they want, they can take the, those diamond coins or those diamond bars home with them if they if yep. they win enough money. So yeah. that's an interesting concept. It, it really is. And, Community and, engagement as well, right? Well, everything, right? So <laughs> um, going back to reward points or, or consumer engage and engagement tokens, in Web2 space, you can't really determine what the, the value of those things are because they're actually funded by kind of marketing budgets and discounted discounts on products. So, you know, whether I get a box of wine or, you know, a set, a new set of Bose headphones, deter, you know, is determined by that particular organization's discount to the, the, the rewards um, system. Flip that on its head and you're providing rewards that have real world value, even de minimis, right? Even tiny value. That token can be aggregated, it can be swapped, it can be exchanged, it can be um, put onto marketplaces. You know, you have plenty of other, uh, you know, built in utility on a public ledger. And every one of those tokens is, is you know, backed by some asset. And it might be, you know, Diamond Standard is a great example because what they're doing is they're taking something which is, uh, you know, every diamond is different. Every diamond you know, is truly non-fungible. And they're turning it into something which is fungible and divisible and therefore can back you know, a token which carries that value. These are things which are, are just emerging and um, you know, super exciting. And stablecoins are the at the heart of it. It's the primitive that allows for... Um, these token economies to form in a way that is both familiar and um, and entirely innovative and new. Yeah, I think with stablecoins, the line is going to blur. Like we think of stablecoins started just as the US dollar and now gets into other kinds mm. of fiat. But of course, you could have gold, you can have diamonds, like we said. And really, it's it's the same tool set to have things like stocks and bonds and things like that backing up as, as well. So yeah. that line, I think, is going to blur over time. Well, the, the, the challenge is in the regulatory treatment of those things. Um, so jurisdiction to jurisdiction, there may be a, a you know difference, or there will be a difference of opinion on what the backing of those stable coins turns that token into. You know what what the difference between a, you know a payment token or a um, a, a fully collateralized or cash backed token um, versus something which is um, backed by a commodity like gold or a diamond or something which is more derivative and then uh, you know verging on security that's will that will be different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction so the legal architecture around these things is going to be the the biggest challenge and you know the governments of the world are trying to sort it out right now the the technical nature of it and the um the ability to issue these tokens and back them and you know by whatever you want is um, actually going to become very much easier especially now with the stablecoin studio all that heavy lifting is done for you well let's hope the governments get it right they're, they're going to waffle a little bit but hopefully in the end they, they make the right choice here all right so the last thing we want to get into is rob we saw the first announcement of a use case coming out of the enterprise program your enterprise program and it made quite an impressive splash of course we're talking about the world pay uh, settlement and proof of reserve system mm -hmm. can you give us any insights on that yeah, I think you've got Sai on the show, have you? You've done an interview with Sai from WorldPay. We did, and we he's did, we just had him on. Way more um, articulate on uh, on this than me, but just uh, just a kind of a brief summary then. So the Hashgraph Enterprise Program was set up in April for um, the purposes of activating governing council use cases and you know, their peers across industries and sectors. We have got a, a number of those projects in program at the moment and the world pay one is the first that we've been able to make public announcement on it is an amazing use case it deals with a real world problem that they have in proving reserves to merchants to drive the adoption of uh, stable coins within their within their ecosystem for people who understand the the four party kind of card payment network infrastructure or architecture it solves half of that it solves half one leg of the uh, the four party architecture and and it takes it from you know multi day settlement down to you know a few seconds of settlement um, if you're using stablecoins 
So on a number of fronts, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing to finally be, to be able to make a public announcement about one of our projects, which is great, with a, a very supportive and active governing council member who have been working in the, diligently in the background to you know, bring this to market. And uh, with our partners, um, BCW, who have um, launched their Axiom Pro product, which does the, the proof of reserve. And um, so all of those things are, are great. Plus, of course, you know, it's, it's always good to, to make a public announcement about a, an enterprise use case that uh, is solving a real problem. So super interested in helping them moving, moving through into, this isn't a, pr- a proof of concept. There is a, a clear intent to take, that, take this to production. And um, our first milestone was designed to coordinate or align with the token 2049 event so that we, it could be announced. And now we're back to um, working through the, the delivery, uh, which should probably run to the end of the year. Sai made it very clear that they're planning on coming to market. This isn't just a, a fun little side project that they have going absolutely, on. Absolutely, absolutely. I do want to say thank you so much for the questions for the audience. Make sure if you have any additional questions, drop them down there in the comments. Yep. And Rob, we'll see you next week. Thank you. The backlog of questions is building up. So um, I'm looking forward to uh, another one next week from Europe. I'll be, um, I'll be heading to um, Europe next week. So you'll, uh, we'll, I'll be talking from there. So Rob always has great insights. You know, as, as we all know, and again, you were touching on the stablecoin studio whilst you're there. And I think one important thing to note that I didn't mention just now, uh, or rather before Rob spoke, was that Hedera really is positioning itself to capture a non-USD market. That's not to say we're not part of the USD market. Of course, we have the circle integration. But the thesis that we're going under is that in the next five years, there'll be explosive growth in non-USD currencies. So that might be the euro, given the very robust framework with the MECA regulations. That might be the Singapore dollar, like we've got with Straits X. You know, they've got a very forward-looking regulatory outlook as well. But it is more likely also to be in sort of the Latin American regions, the African regions, and so on and so forth, where they're having these fintech booms and the most efficient technology to enable those booms are stable coins. And so we've got Standard Bank, the biggest bank by assets in Africa, looking at a digital RAN, I believe it was. You know, we've got Shinhan in, in Asia, where there's a massive growing sort of pro crypto scene, even though it's very difficult to get listed there. HBAR is listed there, thankfully. But they all also have their banks looking into it, like Shinhan and so on. And then Taiwan with Cathy Bank and so on. So we are positioning ourselves with these non USD players so that in these regions where regulations are moving more quickly or fintech booms are happening at a quicker pace, we will be able to capture that liquidity, I believe. And so as the USD dominance goes down, hopefully the Hedera dominance will go up when it comes to stable coins. So yeah, exciting times there for sure. And uh, yeah, a lot of exciting things to look out over the next, next years. Well covered. And we're going to go from a serious topic with stable coins into one that's a little bit more fun. Of course, I was down at Karate Combat 41. It was the most incredible card I've ever seen. The venue was amazing. But Karate Combat has been doing pretty well as far as their social metrics as well, right, Zep? We saw massive pickup from non-MMA commentators like Keemstar, who covers everything from influencers to gaming, over 2 million subscribers. He was commenting on it. We had other Web3 personalities commenting on it. We had MMA voices commenting on it. We had legacy MMA or fighters and boxers talking about it. It really blew up. And so I think there was a, actually a clip from the NFT Morning Show as well who covered it. And they covered how it's got, you know, over 6 million views. So let's, I think if we get them up now, that'd be a good one to listen out to. Karate <laughs> Combat streams their live event on X, gets nearly 3 million views. Literally the best viral this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. It's literally the best uh, crypto business besides like Coinbase and like, you know, the big time businesses like this. This is the best new crypto business. This and friend tech. They didn't need to do a crypto integration on this, but they believe like properly believe in crypto and they're just crushing it. They're absolutely crushing it. Anyway, go ahead, Nick. Uh, Looks like you could get really messed up participating in that. (laughs) 
Yeah, Zep, it was incredible to see that clip and people realizing the potential of the consumer engagement for Karate Combat. And we've been seeing some really good pickup as far as how many people are using the Up Only Gaming. At Karate Combat 39, there was only like 40 or 50 million karate that were actually put up on Up Only Gaming. That jumped to over 400 million in Karate Combat 40. And for Karate Combat 41, it was close to 700 million. And for the players, it's even more impressive. So for that first event with Up Only Gaming, we had about 1,500. For Karate Combat 40, there was over 2,500, and there was nearly 4,500 for Karate Combat 41. So we're seeing like 70% event over event growth. This is really amazing, and I think it's only going to continue. And Zepp, I caught up with one of the co-founders of Karate Combat, and he was the mastermind behind all this up-only gaming and the karate token and everything else. And we really did a deep dive into the token and up-only gaming. So let's listen in. Today, we welcome one of the founders of Karate Combat and the force behind the Karate Token and, of course, their push into Web3. Of note is he likes to stay behind the scenes and keep the focus where it should be on the fights and the fighters and maybe today on the token. So we're going to be doing this one in audio only. That said, we are going to be talking about that Karate Token and maybe getting into the bull case around it. So understand that none of this is financial advice. Of course, there are risks involved. There is custody risk. There is regulatory risk. Just like with any cryptocurrency, and each cryptocurrency is going to be a little bit different. But for me, personally, I was willing to take that risk, but it's going to be up to each individual and maybe talking to their financial advisor and so forth. But with all of that out of the way, only LARPing, welcome. Thank you very much, sir. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, to start, can you just tell us what made you want to create the Karate Token and Up Only Gaming in the first place? Yeah, the reason the Karate Token exists and why we did all this craziness is for Up Only Gaming. So that was the beginning of the Web3 journey for Karate Combat. I myself have been in the space going back a decade and have been helping to build Karate Combat from the beginning, going back about six years. We did the entire Web3 platform to enable Up Only Gaming. Karate Combat itself it has very large awareness within its core demographics of young males, over 5 million followers. We get a couple hundred million organic views on the internet every month. Our content is everywhere, but it's, uh, it's not trivial to turn large awareness into super fandom. The biggest stars in the world earn and generate orders of magnitude more revenue than, than the rest of the athletes out there. And there's so few stars in the world. And to really you know, make someone a star, make a platform a star, takes ordinarily takes tons of time and money. And Up Only Gaming is a strategy that we fell in love with to really supercharge that process and make it happen much more efficiently, we hope. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So how has the actual launch of the token and the app compared to your initial vision for it? You know, I think the original vision for it, because I have uh, such a long and obsessive crypto experience, um, the original vision was a little bit more crypto native. Um, when we were first, I mean, I think, you know, the original name for Up Only Gaming was some complicated thing you'd see come right out of DeFi. And originally thinking, oh, we'll just do this on a web app like every other DeFi app that was out a year and a half ago, two years ago. Um, and people can sign in with their own wallets and it'll grow really fast. But in talking to some really smart people in the space that were sort of at the leading forefront of investing in um, advising some of the biggest consumer successes so far in Web3, we realized pretty early on that we needed very dedicated custom front ends. Um, to enable to actually to scale to normal sports fans. Your regular sports fan is probably not going to log in with a web extension on a web app and, and deal with all that funkiness. Uh, so we ended up spending most of the development building really, really slick front ends. The iOS app, which includes a non-custodial wallet from Blade Labs, that launched three months ago. And the Android app, with the same features just launched about 10 days ago. Uh, we do have a web app that you can log in with any compatible wallet, but almost everyone is playing with the, the mobile app and the metrics there are quite good. 
without doubt i've had so much fun playing with it it is just easy to use it's intuitive and everything else the reason why i got involved with the the karate token though is number one i think that cryptocurrency investors in general are, are getting more savvy they, they want to know what's behind it and in this case it's the league itself now of course the the token doesn't represent ownership but there is no ownership with the karate token like i talked about last week so that if you want to go on this ride with karate combat the token is the only way to do it and yeah. i've been watching combat sports for almost my entire life and I'm not sure if it's the pit, if it's these particular fighters, if it's the rule set. I would actually think it's probably the rule set, but I've never seen more entertaining fights. Yeah. Second to no one. I've been impressed with every single event that I've been to, and they seem like they're only getting better. So I believe in the That's good to hear. <laughs> the underlying product. There's no question about that. And then you couple that with again these Cryptocurrency investors, I think, are, are getting smarter, they're getting more savvy. They look at something, I think they're going to look at something like Hedera and say, okay, all these applications, including Karate Combat, are, are building on top of this network, and that's going to generate revenue later on down the line. That's the value proposition for it. It's going to generate revenue to continue to build out the ecosystem, to build out the network itself, to incentivize token holders, nodes, and so forth. Well, in the case of Karate Combat, the Karate Token, it, it's the league that's behind it. And then again, them being more savvy, they're going to look at, well, how much should this thing be worth? Well, right now, based off of the total supply, not the circulating supply, the total market cap for the karate token is about $100 million. I think they're going to look at comps. They're going to say, well, what's the UFC worth? You know, And in the latest deal that the UFC did, I think it was like $12.1 billion when they did the deal with the WWE. So, could in a bull market karate combat the total market cap go to four five six billion dollars i don't know but i think it's certainly possible uh, we don't know if it's going to get there or not so that's the first thing in my head that, that i kind of looked at so could we see a 40 a 50 a 60x i think it's actually possible and then when i was deciding whether to get involved or not this was a, a couple months ago and actually buy some tokens and i didn't get any kind of a sweetheart deal if anybody's wondering i'm just a retail investor i bought them on saucer swap on kucoin just like everybody else i said well there's also going to be the up only gaming aspect of it so i'm going to have some additional tokens and at the time i was like we have about two years i think until the next bull run you know 2025 i could double the tokens i could get and the first one that I was involved with, uh, you know, I, I did the first one, Karate Combat 39, and I didn't really pay close attention to how many more I got because it was just the, the tokens I had gotten through airdrops. But for 40, I was paying a lot of attention because I had more tokens. <laughs> I didn't pick very well. I only got four out of 10, but I still, oh, sorry, man. I still got an, an additional, <laughs> uh, I think, 10 or 12% on top of what awesome. I had. And then this last fight, yeah. 21% because I picked eight out wow. of nine. So it went really well. So wow. The 100% by the next bull run could actually be really conservative. So that's kind of how I'm thinking about things. And it really makes these fights a lot more entertaining when you have skin in the game. I've never been you know, a gambler or anything sure. like that. But it really does keep you on the edge of your seat the entire time. But you know, from your perspective, where does the karate token fit into the crypto landscape? Yeah, so it's the only token in the world that governs and gamifies a real sports league. So um, sports, are, I think, are a great fit for Consumer Web 3 because some of the biggest non-exchange consumer apps in crypto are sports related. So rare, uh, things like Stake, Top Shots, like arguably, I guess arguably, like kicked off the NFT bubble over COVID. So sports are a pretty good fit. It's been demonstrated, but nobody's taken it anywhere near as far as us. So the, the up only gaming idea was first, but to execute on it and to create a karate token that was not just a meme, not just a fan token, we had to radically pivot the entire structure of the league. We were in a really unique position to be able to do that because of, the league was extraordinarily held, like closely held by a couple of us. Um, and before we did any building, we, uh, we set up a ownerless foundation we transferred the entire league to it. So all the prior equity of the league has been completely wiped. The entire league is owned by this ownerless foundation, and we structured the foundation so that it can actually be governed by a token. And again, we did that to execute 
on Up Only Gaming and create a token that was actually meaningful to people. Sports leagues are like a super unique asset in the world. They're like this cultural, like shared cultural asset. Sometimes people are looking at them as like cash flow vehicles, but a lot of times people are looking at them just to own them. They want to control them. And, you know, for the first time ever, as a holder of a token, you can actually have governance power over a sports league. Yeah, it's, it's invaluable. It really is. So what's the plan going forward and, and how does the league grow using this new concept? Yeah, so great question. I think, you know, the league is already growing really fast on its own because it is so fun to watch, A. And then B, we also have this incredibly permissive IP policy. Uh, we've got great international distribution on television, but at the same time it's on TV, we stream it for free on the internet everywhere. So it's extremely easy to watch on YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, Kick. And more recently, we started teaming up with the biggest streamers in the world. At this past event, one of the streamers who was on location had 25 to 30,000 concurrent viewers throughout the entire show. We're ramping up that strategy around the world. We think that the future of global sport is localization through streamers. Younger people today, they want to watch sports with their friends. For some people, that's in a Discord channel. For other people, it's watching their favorite streamer commentate the fight. So we're really big believers in that. So there's big growth engines already behind the league. We see the the up on the gaming and token strategy as a way to like accelerate the super fandom on it. Like sure, like maybe somebody watches you know, half of our events, but are they obsessed with it? You know, maybe not yet. And we think the core way to do that with our demographic, primarily of young males, is to financialize things a little bit. Get people like yourself doing research on the fighters before they show up. Now you know their backstory, their record, who they won against last time, maybe where they're from, their style, their family even. That's really hard to do without unlimited capital. But if you financialize things a little bit, people kind of do it on their own. And then they show up and they're watching it and they really care who wins. Or maybe they're out for the night. They don't get to watch it, but they're still checking their phone to see who won. They're watching the highlights. They really care about the outcome. Man, all that is so hard for a young sports league. So this is our way to supercharge everything. And, um, you know, it's really it's really exciting to hear people like yourselves where it's working, where it's like, wow, I cared so much about this because of up-only gaming. And it's it's hard to convey how hard that is. It takes, like, infinite capital almost to make that happen in the norm, or, like, lightning in a bottle. You know, the PFL, they're spending, I don't know, $5 million plus an event, you know, renting, I don't want to get in trouble with them, but, you know, r- renting massive stars that are already super famous. And, uh, you know, they've had to raise hundreds of millions of dollars and all this stuff. We're looking for ways to create the next UFC without spending that much money, frankly. Well, I've experienced it firsthand. I think you're really on to something. I think consumer engagement is going to be huge in crypto, and you guys are leading the way. Thank you so much for swinging by and giving us your insights. My pleasure, man. And we're going to stick with the consumer engagement and and fight scene as well with Legends of the Past. We've talked about their Clio Mint that's coming up. That's going to be next Wednesday, the 27th. So definitely follow them on Twitter, on X, to make sure you have all the update information so you can participate and join the Clio committee. And Zep, let's take one of our famous hard left turns here. We're going to get into the other major council member use case that was announced this week. And that was ServiceNow on top of Envision Blockchain. Can you talk a little bit about that? The first thing to really mark down is that the regenerative finance narrative, which we've been covering for a while, has now been picked up by a major institution. ReFi is inherently a way of transforming existing financial flows, particularly within the climate markets like carbon credits that are often seen as exploitative by creating a new financial ecosystem surrounding these assets. So that financial ecosystem at its very core must cater to all the stakeholders, particularly the ones on the ground doing most of the work in regions like the Global South, where they're usually neglected or you know, usually don't get as much as the financing as you would, would warrant from the, the masses of money going into this industry. To address this at a very fundamental level, the sort of books, the, the, the financial books have to be opened. And what that means is essentially it has to be put on a public ledger. Everything that's going through 
these markets from issuance of a carbon credit to retirement of a carbon credit to all of the processes before that, whether that's you know, consultants or registries, whoever it is, you should be able to track all of the money throughout the sort of life cycle of everything that goes on before the issuance of that credit to the very end where it's retired so that you can see where money's being wasted, where money's being siphoned or so on. It's essentially ensuring trust in a very, very murky market in its current form. Like I said, this needs to be done on a public ledger to ensure that trust. And as we know, the Hedera Guardian and Hedera are the fundamental ledger within this market, within Web3, that are enabling that accountability to happen. So where does ServiceNow actually come into this then? ServiceNow are acting as the arm, I think, to bring refi to the institutions. And in this case, it's inexorably linked to the Hedera Guardian and thus Hedera. So they are giving this narrative credibility. They're bringing it into the mainstream enterprise and enabling them to sort of fulfill this vision where the biggest offsetters in the world will be pushing that vision, essentially. Every single company in the world at the moment, particularly in the Fortune 500, need to be offsetting their carbon. They need to be tracking their emissions and they need to be doing this in a trusted, transparent way so they can report it to the various auditors and so on to show that what they're actually doing has real world benefits. Currently, because of the lack of transparency, the lack of auditability, most of the carbon credits that are offset off decentralized public ledgers like Hedera are generally futile. I think we saw that it was something like 80% of various credits actually were nowhere near the grade they said they were or anywhere near as beneficial to the environment as they said they were. And so every investor basically needs, every auditor needs the verifiable information to ensure that no greenwashing, i.e. double spending, i.e. not fulfilling promises, is happening. And this is a typical problem with renewable energy certificates. So within the Guardian ecosystem now, within the ServiceNow ecosystem now, you have the ability to create these renewable energy certificates, but on a public ledger, on Hedera, so that all the information is verifiable, so that every single renewable energy credit comes with an audit trail of information, where it is generated, I see who, who has generated it, see who has signed it, see who has transferred it, minted it, and so on and so forth, to ensure that all of this is only being done once. So now, not only have all of the companies within the, the service now sort of ecosystem, which is 80% of the Fortune 500, not only they're exposed to the Guardian, but they're exposed to the inherent benefits of the Guardian and so that they can now fulfill their vision of needing to track their emissions, offset their emissions, but in a trusted way that is only enabled by the Hedera Guardian in this current climate. So I think this is an early stage integration. I think there's going to have to be a lot of education done around it. But at the very, very crucial point, at the crux of it, is the ability for 80% of the Fortune 500s to be able to track their carbon emissions through renewable energy certificates to then prove that they can offset or move towards their sustainability goals in a trusted and transparent way, which they couldn't before. So when you think of the long-term vision of things like net zero 2050, I think you can really see the Hedera Guardian through other partners like ServiceNow becoming a crucial, crucial component of this offsetting ecosystem. And I feel like this is the first domino for that mass institutional adoption, but I'm sure we'll see more coming in the following months. And I love how ServiceNow describes it on their website. They say, the ServiceNow ESG refi application empowers companies, organizations, and their ecosystems to generate climate assets by seamlessly integrating with the Hedera Guardian open source tokenization engine. This integration is designed to work with the Envision blockchain managed Guardian service, utilizing the innovative Hedera Hashgraph distributed ledger technology to track climate assets and individual token provenance. And Zep, next week, we're going to get the inside track. I'm going to have Daniel Norkin of Envision Blockchain on, and he's going to tell us everything we need to know about this new ServiceNow integration. All right, but that's not all the refi we have this week. We also have some information coming out of Dovu. Can you tell us about that? So another massive player in the Hedera Guardian ecosystem is, of course, Dovu. Dovu have been the major marketplace, carbon marketplace on Hedera for a long time, combating issues such as double spending that we touched on before. And this week, they had a massive announcement with the Indian government for a friendly car recycling initiative within which the incentive 
for the people recycling is that they receive these green credits as they understand so that they can move to their own sort of ESG goals and so that the Indian government can move towards their own targets for net zero. And so crucially, as the main partner there for providing these green credits, for providing these immutable green credits on the Hedera Guardian within the Hedera Guardian to avoid issues like double spending and for auditors to get a complete audit trail of what is going on with that transparency, with that reportability to the Indian government, they've selected Dover. So, you know, what bigger testament to their team there, what bigger testament to what they're doing there. And again, that's another major, major institution doubling down on the Hedera Guardian ecosystem. And a couple quotes from the team here. I have the CEO of MMCM. He says, as the drive for cleaner mobility and alternative fuels intensifies, the sustainable retirement of older vehicles becomes paramount. This not only fuels the automotive sector's advancement, but also paves the way for less congested roads. And the CEO of Dovu goes on to say, this is a hugely significant contract. We have built our platform to be the infrastructure of digital green credits at scale. The news today confirms that we are on the right path. We're proud to be working with these industry leaders to help solve a growing problem and build a growing market together. So congratulations to all the teams there. All right, so we're, now we're going to get into another team that we've heard about many times in the past. And of course, that's Drop. And Drop got some pretty good coverage by Forbes this past week. So the Forbes article was entitled, FedNow has launched as blockchain innovation delivers next-gen instant payments. And they highlighted Drop saying, blockchain technologies could deploy FedNow as infrastructure for fiat on-ramps or off-ramps now. The FedNow service provider showcase an online resource connecting financial institutions and instant payment service providers recently featured Drop, a Hedera-based micropayments platform. So it's great to see Drop still getting the credit that they deserve. Uh, but I caught up with Sushil. Of course, he is the CEO of Drop to go over an integration that they made that's not just important for the Hedera ecosystem, but the broader crypto ecosystem as well. So listen in. Welcome back, Sushil. Hey, good morning. Thank, thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. Of course, I am too. So you guys have an interesting integration. Can you just start off by explaining what is Wallet Connect and why should users of Web3 be interested in this technology? Sure, absolutely. Wallet Connect is uh, sort of new in the game in terms of it's been there only for like last couple of years. But it, what it is, is it's, a, it's an open source protocol. It's sort of a bridge between dApps and mobile apps. Okay, digital wallets. Actually, I shouldn't even say mobile apps, digital wallets, which could even be an extension or could be a mobile app, right? So think about, you know, the way I've been explaining people is think about before Wallet Connect, every dApp had to build some sort of an integration layer so that I could connect my digital wallet to that dApp. So it was a lot of these one-off that was going on and it was it, it was okay, people were using MetaMask, they were they were using all these different technologies. And then this was mostly on Ethereum. And then on every blockchain, every dApp developer had to build an integration layer to connect the digital wallet. So it's, it's multiplied by the number of blockchains and the num number of apps, right? So Wallet Connect came up with a standard. That's the open source protocol by which every digital wallet could connect to the dApp in a universal method. So they came up with a universal method by which you connect. The other way to look at it uh, because I was trying to explain that to a friend of mine who, who's not very technical, is think about Bluetooth. Once you had Bluetooth technology, which came out like 20 years back, every electronic device could connect to another device. They didn't have to worry about how, as long as you followed the standard. It's sort of similar. I mean, I'll keep the analogy only till that point, but it's sort of similar. It's like if you have a digital wallet, which is Wallet Connect enabled, and you have a DAP, like an NFT marketplace, which is wallet connect enable it gives you a method a common method to connect okay so that's sort of like and it's a very secure and a private way where you don't have to share your private key so typically what happens is if i build an nft marketplace i will connect with drop i'll build something with drop i'll build something with let's say in hedera blade connect or hashback i'll build those adapters to connect and it's quite a bit of an effort with Wallet Connect, as long as you are Wallet Connect enabled, they give you a very easy method for every digital wallet to connect to them. So why do you need to connect to an NFT marketplace or any DApp? Is because it gives you 
this is a new Web3 commerce method. And that really is, is why I'm very interested in and people, users should be interested. This is an entirely new way of commerce where there is no, no intermediary, where the digital wallet is connecting directly to the marketplace. It's a peer-to-peer -peer communication. And as you understand in, in the DeFi space, a, in a peer-to-peer -peer communication, you don't share your private key. You don't want to share everything with the other party. You want to keep it as private and as secure. Wallet Connect lets you do that, right? And the, the way it, it works at, at a very high level is you go to a DAP, and in this case, I'm going to use an example of an NFT marketplace, and you say connect, and it will give you a QR code. You scan it using your uh, digital, uh, your mobile wallet, or if you have an extension, it, it will pop that up. And basically, you share a key. Uh, there's a little bit more technology to, to with it uh, uh, behind this, but you share a key which the NFT market will, will produce and you create a secure connection. And after that, you and the, the app can communicate securely. You can share transaction. You can sign the transaction. There's a lot more that can happen. But it is a really unique way for digital wallets and the apps to connect and then transmit uh, information with them. And there's a lot more, lot more to it, but Wallet Connect is one of the standards that's out there. Most popular blockchains have it. Hadera took the Wallet Connect and built an SDK around it uh, so that we could use it. And that's where we are. Drop went ahead and took the Hadera's SDK for Wallet Connect and implemented that in the drop. All right, so you gave us kind of the high level yeah. view, but why did Drop specifically want to integrate Wallet Connect? Uh, sure. So as you understand, Drop, uh, Drop is a micropayment platform. We enable both fiat, uh, which is US dollar, and we have built everything and we continue to build everything on the banking rails. But Drop is also a Hadera wallet. I mean, natively, that's what a Drop wallet is. It's a digital Hadera wallet. As we see changes in the Web3 world, as we see new improvements, and we keep building that in. Just a couple of weeks back, we introduced USDC uh, from different blockchains. Now we're introducing Wallet Connect because that's another way of, of commerce. So in, in Drop, you can do an in-person payment. You can actually pay someone in person, uh, like you can pay someone $2, $10. You can do absolutely do web commerce. We have built all sorts of widgets with WordPress plugin and pay links by which you can actually do commerce on the web. And this is our third leg, which is Web3 commerce, right? Where you can attach your, and I call it attach, you can attach your digital wallet to the DAP and transmit information, transmit and uh, transmit transactions in between uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. So we are absolutely uh, interested in Web3 commerce. That's going to be the new way of commerce. You know, We had Web commerce, Web2 commerce, and now this is Web3 commerce. And this is just the start. Uh, you would see a lot more happening in the near future in this Web3 commerce. So we're definitely interested in that. So, Sushil, maybe for the other builders out there, what were some of the challenges in implementing this tech? Wallet Connect is still new, uh, although I keep saying that uh, it does have, based on everything that we see, they have about 300 different digital wallets uh, that, that have uh, Wallet Connect enabled. There are 3,000 DAS, but I think it's still new. So the way Wallet Connect works is every blockchain, like in this case, Hadera, had to implement their piece of code and they have to integrate that with Wallet Connect and then offer to the community, which is what Hadera did. So this implementation is still young. So, and we worked with Hadera. I mean, we had some issues and the team was really good, thanks. Team was really good in fixing some of the issues that we had uh, in the implementation. But it does take a little bit of fine tuning and we had some challenges, but they were like, you know, it took us about three weeks to build all of this. As you understand, in Drop, uh, the challenge is not only do we have a digital wallet, we also have extensions on every browser there. So our challenge was a little bit more because of the extent of what Drop offers. So it, it took us a couple of weeks to build this, but it's, it's out there and I, I would really encourage the community to start using it because this really brings Hadera deeper and closer to the DeFi world, it brings us closer to the Web3 commerce and we're moving towards the DeFi space and this really helps us with that. The other challenge that we had, Brandon, is what, what I just shared with you is Wallet Connect lets you transmit transactions where you as a DAP send, will send me a transaction and I sign that transaction. 
Now that transaction could be a smart contract, it could be a scheduled transfer, it could be all sorts of rich transaction type. Uh, the challenge was not really the issues with the SDK, the issue was user interface. How do you make it really, really simple when someone sees the transaction for them to understand what it is, right? Because it, it's a cryptic code. I mean, that's the problem with the, the entire uh, Web3 world. It's not very user friendly. So we, most of the time that we spent wasn't implementing Wallet Connect. It was making it really simple and easy for an end user to see what they are looking at and then sign the transaction. You don't want to sign something which you didn't understand. So, and I, I think we've just started it. Every transaction we're looking at it, we're trying to break it down so that to make it readable, to make it easy for the consumer to understand that. That was a challenge and it's nothing to do with implementation. That's how it is. And I think uh, we've solved the problems when you want to transfer a token or currency from your wallet to the DAP. Uh, we, uh, we think we solve it. I think the next problem we're going to solve is how to how to see a, a smart contract coming in your way and how do you really decipher that and make it readable. So there are some challenges, but I think uh, Wallet Connect definitely has uh, solved the bigger one, which is how do you connect securely, privately, and they solved it. So I think it's a good solution out there. So Shil, it's it's so good to set these standards, but what other blockchains, you know, apps, wallets are supporting Wallet Connect? In the Herrera community, I think uh, some of the wallets have already started implementing Wallet Connect. Very soon you will see some of the NFT marketplaces start using it. I think we are working with one of them and we'll announce that they will be implementing Wallet Connect. It, it, it takes a while for the adoption. It just, uh, Herrera just uh, released it a couple of months back, the, uh, the SDK. But if you go beyond Herrera, right, and if you go to Ethereum and you go to uh, Polkadot, you go to Cosmo, there, there's a wide wide range of uh, applications, anything from Uniswap to Ablo. I mean, there's a lot of mega players out there who have implemented a Wallet Connect, including Coinbase. I mean, Coinbase had their own, I'm glad you asked this question. Coinbase had their own coin link, I think, a connector by which you could connect two dApps. And now they're they are using Wallet Connect. MetaMask has Wallet Connect. So I think there's a, a broad level of acceptance here. Uh, and I'm really glad that Hadera introduced it. Uh, because we need to follow as many standards as we can, and then you can you get broadly accepted by the the entire DeFi community, not just the Hadera community. So. Yeah, sure. So uh, finally, how exactly does this help Hadera and, and our community specifically? Yeah, I I, I think, um, and I alluded, alluded to that before. It really brings us much closer to the DeFi community. You know, the more you implement these these standards. Uh, you get broadly accepted as another major DeFi player. And we are, we are there. You know, we, we have so many of the technology in Hadera that makes us completely DeFi-centric. Uh, implementing Wallet Connect, and there are some other standards too that are coming in. Implementing standards like that really makes a big difference just in terms of the respect you get in the DeFi community. And then it just gets easier for anyone to build something on Hadera. So this is, uh, by the way, Wallet Connect is also uh, across uh, blockchains. So you could really build a DAP and accept connections from different blockchains. So then you start playing the cross blockchain interfaces very easily. You know, you can start building those applications. So it, it helps us in lots of different ways. We, Hadera is not a silo, right? We have to be working with a blockchain and that's what technologies like Hashboard and many of those other technologies do that for Hadera. This is yet another way of us getting involved in the broader DeFi community. Sushil, thanks for telling us about Wallet Connect and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. So another great integration with Drop. And with that, let's get into some network analysis. All right. So we have seen a drop off. This is really normal as Atmio makes tweaks. It always comes back with a vengeance. So I just asked the community to zoom out a little bit just because we've had this little bit of a dip. That doesn't mean it's going to stick around. Again, we've had these in the past and I know we're going to bounce back. Still over the past 24 hours, we've had a total transaction count of over 36 million and a max TPS of nearly 1400. Time to consensus is still well below four seconds. And looking at the fungible tokens over the past week, wrapped H bar is in that top spot, followed by our meme coin zero, then energy trade token, sauce, dovu, and karate. We also see not a protocol, USDC, jam, and hella swap in that top 10.
And looking at our NFTs, we still have Road Code in that top spot. Earthlings is doing well with a couple representatives in the top 10. Karatika has a couple as well. Hashgraph Naming Service. And Hangry Barboons is in there as well. All right, Zeb, do you have anything as far as NFTs this week? Yep, so Valve Games, the MMORPG built on Hedera, got over, I think, 45,000 hashback accounts associated with its NFT drop. And I think now is the biggest NFT collection with over 1 million NFTs within its arsenal. So that's a huge amount of NFTs, a huge amount of NFTs that's going to be used within their game and uh, excited to see where they take us. And hopefully a lot of those accounts will transition into users. And then a lot of Vival Games' original sort of user base from where they were a game a few years ago or so will also be over into this new rendition of the game on Hedera. So exciting to see that first big, I think, game coming to the Hedera network. Yeah, and that's a big one. And of course, another game that we want to highlight once again, we talked about him a little bit earlier, but his Legends of the Past, look out for Clio. That's going to be a big drop as well. With that, let's go ahead and get into some DeFi. Taking a look at DeFi Llama, not including state or liquid staking, the total value locked in the Hedera DeFi ecosystem is just about $32 million. SaucerSwap makes up about 28 of that, and HelloSwap makes up most of the balance. The farming rewards on some of SaucerSwap's popular trading pairs stands at 6% on HBAR HBAR X, 25% on HBAR Sauce, 28% on HBAR USDC, and 23% on HBAR Karate. Over on HelloSwap, HBAR HBAR X is at 4%, 81% on HBAR Heli, 24% on HBAR USDC, and 54% on HBAR Karate. Of note, the returns on HelloSwap don't include LP rewards where SaucerSwap does, which needs to be taken into consideration. And on par, this would boost the Heli rewards a bit, making those Karate rewards even more impressive. You can take a look at the SaucerSwap analytics page to see what the separated LP rewards are. Taking a look at the crypto and HBAR markets, both Bitcoin and HBAR are about flat on the week, which is pretty impressive considering the S&P is nearly off 2.5% during that time. At the time of recording, HBAR is sitting at just about $0.05. Cents. You can see how it was acting like resistance a few weeks ago and is now acting like support. So this has become a really key level. Granted, HBAR is like a leaf in a hurricane considering the broader markets. Now, seasonality and the stock market rolling over has me feeling a bit defensive, but time will tell. All right, Zeb, that's pretty much all we have. Is there anything else you'd like to pass on? Uh, I think, you know, what is, excites me the most about this week, you know, having the team go to permissionless and tech crunch and these other events is again just having us at the forefront of these narratives and having the infrastructure there and the partners there to facilitate that vision and keep us at the forefront alongside the technology itself so of course you've got the stable coins that we mentioned the stable coin studio we've got real world assets with aberdeen and and dla piper but we've also got regenerative finance and dmrv which are two massive i think under the cover narratives which Perhaps they'll never get that mainstream news adoption, but they'll get that mainstream adoption from real world institutions that have to have these uh, carbon offsets as a critical part of their sort of day to day operations, or at least their date, their, you know, their end of year reporting and so on and so forth. So it seems like we've got two core narratives that are at the forefront of everyone's mind, real world assets and stable coins. Then we've got our sort of secret source, which is the Hedera Guardian which I really think will probably be one of the first things that takes us to that widespread institutional adoption. So there's a lot going on on Hedera, a lot of infrastructure being built, a lot of plants being sown, and we're starting to see the seeds become, you know, bushes, and then I think there'll be trees and forests by the end of, you know, the next five years or so. So an exciting time for us all, and uh, hopefully in the next sort of year or so, the market will, will catch up with that. So next week, we have some exciting stuff. I'm going to have Fresh Supply Co. on. We tried to get them on a few weeks ago, but we're going to get them on for a Twitter space. That's going to be at 7 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday. So definitely check that one out because, of course, they are essentially taking all the business from MasterCard Provenance and putting it on Hedera. So that's exciting. We're also going to get Daniel Norkin, as I mentioned, to talk about that service now use case. And, of course, we're going to get Shark Bites on again. So make sure you drop your questions for Rob down there in the comments. That's all we have. We'll see you next week.